Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Rumi Forum. This is my third time here myself uh, as a, a new guest. I'm a, somebody who has just really started to learn about uh, Turkish-American relations. I'm a member of the Virginia General Assembly. I have served for the last seven years in the Virginia House. We are the, I like to say, we're the oldest uh, continuing, continually functioning uh, legislative body in the Western Hemisphere. And it is, uh, we're as old as the Blue Mosque in uh, Istanbul, is what I learned last year. The, when we were pounding those uh, trees in to make a fort in Jamestown, uh, the, our, the Ottoman Empire was building a, a beautiful mosque that has stood the test of time. I'm a, a Democrat, and uh, last night was a bad night for our party, <laughs> which is uh, a, a part of the reason for this uh, subject today. I'm former chairman of the Democratic Party in Fairfax County, which is the largest jurisdiction in our state. Um, you know, the U.S. electorate was in a foul mood, and, uh, you know, incumbency, which is normally an advantage in any election, was, uh, was not an advantage last night. It was, it was a distinct disadvantage. And uh, my Republican friends, and they, they are my friends, uh, took uh, full advantage of the situation and outfoxed uh, both the Obama administration and, and the congressional leadership leading up to these elections. But uh, domestic and international observers alike uh, we are going to be trying over the next little bit to ferret out the potential impacts of the Republican control of the House of Representatives and, of course, a much slimmer uh, Democratic control in, in the U.S. Senate. So uh, here to discuss this today is uh, not a stranger at all to the Rumi Forum, uh, Dr. Joshua Walker. Um, several of you have probably heard uh, Dr. Walker speak before. He's an assistant professor at the University of Richmond. That's one reason I took an interest in him, because I'd like to promote fellow Virginians. Uh, he teaches inter, uh, international and cross-cultural leadership studies there. He's taking this year in Boston at, at Harvard and Brandeis to do a postdoc, and he's a research fellow there producing a book. So uh, you've probably all read him before. He just had an article out last week where you know, he uh, mentioned that uh, U.S.-Turkish relationship is experiencing, is experiencing its most significant uh, periods of turbulence in our history, and, and that as, uh, just to set the tone, as uh, Iran, Russia, and Turkey continue to compete for regional influence, America has been largely absent. So with that uh, uh, positive note, I will turn it over to Dr. Walker. <coughs> Thank you, Mark. I really appreciate you guys coming out with so many different things going on. <clears throat> if you're like me and Mark, we were both out watching the elections and also commenting on the elections on, on various programs. And so, you know, you come in with a very humbled attitude, particularly when you're talking about a subject like we are today. Um, I think last summer, less than four months ago, when I was sitting in this very same spot, I, I was making the point, a very pessimistic point, that U.S.-Turkish relations looked like they were heading towards a, a, a point, a major juncture. Now. I am not generally a pessimist. I always tend to see the, the, the glass as being half full in almost everything. Um, but as Mark has already indicated, I see some serious turbulence and some serious problems ahead. So what I'd like to do in my talk is to not spend 30 minutes and 45 minutes talking at you, but I'd like to talk with you. And so with your permission, what I'd like to do is spend about 10 or 15 minutes kind of laying things out as I see them today. Uh, and then talking about what the elections might mean in that context, and then opening up for discussion. I know that Mark has some questions, and those of you uh, here obviously have a lot of questions, and there's probably a lot of expertise in this room. Um, so I'd really like to lay it that out in that way. I'd like to lay it out in this way. I'd like to look at it from a domestic point of view, a regional point of view, and an international point of view. And each one of those, I think, leads us to a more positive place. But that means that I have to start with the most negative, and that's domestic. What's fascinating about what's happening today in U.S. and Turkey is the fact that both are democracies, which is usually a good thing. But when it comes to uh, democracies in which there are nationalist and populist forces, there are going to be problems. And I think what we're seeing today is almost mere images of each other. You have a resurgent party in Turkey that has been in power for eight years and doesn't seem in to show any signs of waning. You have a prime minister that has won election after election that is in a stronger position than any political leader, civilian political leader, has ever been in Turkish history, except perhaps the founder of the modern republic, Ataturk, uh, with uh, Tayyip Erdogan. And I think in America you have the opposite. Uh, in 2008 there was an amazing, overwhelming sense of optimism, something that's hard to think about today, the day after the midterm elections. But Obama came to the U.S. with a real sense of change and was really going to transform America's position around the world, which I think, as I'll talk about in the international section, I think he largely has in terms of the image problems that the U.S. had under the former administration. But on a domestic scene, he, he's confronting a very difficult situation where he's got a divided house with Congress being taken by the Republicans 
Republicans in the Senate uh, being much uh, smaller majority for the Democrats. It seems that whatever the president and the administration is going to try to do on the foreign level, they're going to continually confront uh, uh, a, a Republican Party. Particularly on the American scene, we don't actually know what to expect yet. A lot of the Republicans that have just won with the large majority in the House are, very, are, are largely untested. We don't actually know what the quote-unquote Tea Party means. If we were to take Sarah Palin as a litmus test of this, it's deeply concerning, but we actually don't know what it would be like to have a Sarah Palin in the Congress or in the, in the Senate or, God forbid, uh, in the presidency. <laughs> and so I think it's very important to understand and to take with a grain of salt what people say on the campaign trail and what they'll actually do. Because I do think there are structural constraints. Um, on the Turkish scene, you know, you're, you're basically, we've just seen the referendum on September 12th. Those of you that are not into the nitty gritty of Turkish politics, <coughs> this was a largely symbolic gesture. This was not the complete changing of a constitution that many of us had been hoping for. The constitution in Turkey has been the same since the military coup in 1980. Uh, many of us that want and, and desire a more free, democratic, transparent, and open Turkey had been pushing for a much broader sweeping change. But because of the domestic politics in Turkey and because of the polarization that's taken place, largely not on a left-right spectrum in the way that you would think about in the US, but largely on a, uh, if you want to use these terms, I hate these terms, but secular versus more conservative Muslim point of view. Uh, that's the divide that we're seeing. And so I think that that tendency that we're seeing, that divide in Turkey, has only been exacerbated by what we saw on September 12th. And basically, in the run-up to the elections that will be happening in more or less June of next year, the Turkish Prime Minister and the AKP, the Justice and Development Party that have been ruling for eight years, have very little incentive uh, to try to find ways to compromise and work with their opponents. Because clearly, they're in the strongest position. They have the largest number of seats in the parliament. They're able to push through pretty much whatever they want in the Turkish context, which makes it particularly difficult uh, to look at the problem aspects here. Um, I think those of you that have read my writings and those of you that know me know that I generally uh, have been a fan of what the Justice and Development Party have done. I think that in, in the broad sweep of history in the last eight years, we've seen more changes and more positive developments for the Republic of Turkey than at any point in its history. History. But I'm deeply concerned and troubled by some of the behavior and the rhetoric that I'm seeing. In particular, I've just gotten back from Lebanon and Syria and Azerbaijan, and you know the feeling that there is in the region is one of uh, very. Uh, it's not just optimism; it's unrealistic expectations of Turkey, and that's something that we all saw in 2008 with our own president and what he was coming into. There's no way that one man could change everything and change history. And so I think in some ways that the AKP and the Prime Minister in particular, uh, given his rhetoric against Israel and given the sanctions vote on Iran, has clearly taken a lot of this rhetoric he's hearing from those in the region to his head. And the behavior that he's, he's, been, he's been exhibiting has been both erratic at certain points of time and concerning uh, at other areas. But I think on the whole, what's been going on in Turkey in terms of domestic changes, and I think uh, more importantly, the regional changes are, are a particularly good thing. So let me switch to the regional very quickly. You know, the regional dynamics in Turkey are absolutely fascinating. If I were to highlight uh, out of the three places I pointed out the most interesting developments, I think regional would be where I point. Because the regional really combines the international and the domestic in some ways. All the domestic developments that I was talking about in both the U.S. and in Turkey have come, come home to roost in some ways in the regional. Clearly, America is a part of this story. Uh, our invasion of Iraq in 2003 really set the tone in some ways. And if I were to take it one step further, I think the, the uh, September 11th attacks really set the tone for how things were going to go moving forward. Because after September 11th, Turkey took on a no, new symbolic value. Uh, a country that had been searching for some type of identity in a post-Cold War environment found it. It was the only truly democratic and secular Muslim majority nation in the region. Make sh you know, pay attention to the way I phrase that. I understand that Malaysia, Indonesia, and India that have large Muslim populations are also democracies, but an indigenous democracy in the Arab world within a m largely Sunni Muslim majority is a unique feature in the Middle East. And that was something that was very attractive to the Bush administration. Um, and so therefore, when um, the war in Iraq happened and the Turkish parliament said no, and I want to be very clear, I was, in, I was in Ankara working at the U.S. Embassy at this point. More people voted for that measure than voted against it. But because of the way the parliamentary procedure works, they, the American government was three votes short of actually pushing it over uh, into, into a, a yes vote that would have allowed U.S. troops to go through. I think hindsight is 2020. The Turks were right in a lot of different ways. The Turks warned the American administration of the problems. Um, 
but that's not to say that they're the reason for that. Like some administration officials like Wolfowitz, Cheney, and others continue to blamed it. But that really set a very sour tone for U.S.-Turkish relations. And on a regional context, actually, Turkey uh, benefited tremendously from this. Our European colleagues who disagreed with us immediately embraced Turkey and said, look, this is a more open and free country. They were able to say no to their kind of Cold War patron in some ways. And so it really helped Turkey in some ways to really see themselves in opposition to the U.S., which is the first time really in our modern history that the U.S. US and Turkey had found themselves on not just opposite ends, because in Cyprus we found ourselves on opposite ends, but on completely opposite ends where we disagreed over a major significant international action. And I think that, that that action has been something that this administration has been trying to clean up ever since 2003. Um, one of the positive side effects of 2003 was that America realized just how important and strategically important Turkey could be. And so starting in around 2007, you saw the U.S. and Turkey changing their attitudes, and particularly on the PKK issue. This is a Kurdish insurgent group that's been waging a civil war against the republic since the 1980s. Um, and the Turks have always been very sensitive about this. And the idea that northern Iraq has been a haven for this terrorist organization has not sat well with any Turkish administration. And when you think about what the new Turkish foreign policy has been about, it's about securing its borders first and foremost. It's about creating security and creating the regional environment in which there can be economic interdependence. The idea of zero problems that the current Foreign Minister Davutoglu has been talking about really is the, at the core of that is being able to have stability at home so you can have peace abroad and kind of taking the, the Ataturk axiom and flipping it on its head, peace at home, peace abroad, and really focusing on that aspect of it. And so the dynamics there seem to be going in a very positive direction. If you were to ask me where things were last year in 2009, I would say that they probably looked like we were going through a honeymoon period. A new president had come in. There seemed to be a real need within the, the Arab world, the, the Middle East in particular, for a leader to emerge. The fact that Type Erdogan is currently the most popular leader in the Arab world is, is both a reflection of smart Turkish policy, but also a lack of Arab leadership in a lot of different ways. The major hindrance, of course, that, that has changed in that year has obviously come from this summer. The Mami Marmara incident, uh, with the flotilla incident where in which the Israeli government uh, boarded the ship and killed nine uh, civilians ca obviously caused consternation. Um, I've been very sympathetic to this. I mean, I think to anybody, if, if, if Iranian soldiers were to take nine civilians in the U.S. and kill them on international waters, I think that you could, you could see the same reaction. And in fact, if anything else, I've heard the Turkish foreign minister at least say this, uh, that if this had been Greece that had done this, there would be a war the next day. And so the fact that there wasn't a war shows you the deepness of the relationship and the historic nature of the relationship between Turkey and Israel. But there's obviously some structural problems between Turkey and Israel. Uh, Israel's government, which is more right-wing and conservative, has a very different view uh, of, of the region and where Israel fits in that region in terms of Israel being a Jewish state and what that means for a two-state so two solution moving forward. Turkey obviously has very clear sympathies uh, for the Palestinian cause, particularly in an environment in a post-2008 environment in which the Gaza operations have happened. The Turkish Prime Minister feels personally betrayed by uh, Ehud uh, Omar, who basically was sitting in his, uh, his sitting in the Prime Minister's office six hours trying to negotiate a settlement between Israel and Syria and the beginning of track one diplomacy. Uh, and so obviously there's a personal betrayal that the Turks feel, the government currently feels. And I think the Mami Marin incident was just the tip of the iceberg in some ways of basically saying enough is enough. Israel can't get away with this all the time. They may be able to kill Palestinians at will, but they can't do this to our citizens. And there was a real sense of pride being hurt in Turkey. And so as a result, I've been sympathetic to watching what's happened in Turkey. That being said, rhetoric is dangerous, and rhetoric, particularly in the Turkish context, can spiral out of control. And so the anti-Israel rhetoric is very close to being anti-Semitic at different points of time in Turkey. I'm not, I, I have never been one to accuse the AKP or any of the leaders there of being anti-Semitic. In fact, I know many of these gentlemen well, and you know, they're, they're just flabbergasted at some of the media portrayals of it. And you know, I think it's important as observers to watch what's being portrayed in the media and understanding what's actually happened. And I do have to say, since the Mami Marmara incident, the types of media portrayals that I've seen have been almost universally negative. To me, that is, that is not the bigger issue. To me, the big issue and the big kind of elephant in the room is Iran. Uh, Turkey, in some ways, it would seem, should be Iran's natural competitor. Iran has a particular view of what the region should look like. They have a particular view that's more revolutionary and more revisionist for the region. 
which is completely contrary to what Turkey wants to do. Turkey wants to have stability. Turkey wants to have good relations with everyone. Turkey wants to be able to be the economic engine that drives the Middle East. And when you think about what happened at the UN General Assembly in terms of uh, Turkey, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon coming together to create the so-called Middle East Union, that's exactly the way that, for example, the European coal and steel community began. And Turkey is the engine behind that. And Turkey's economy, which has been growing at an astronomic rate, it's the second fastest growing economy next to China uh, this last quarter, and by far the, the most healthy, the fastest, and the most dynamic economy in both Europe and the Middle East. Turkey offers a model for something that I think that many people in the Middle East want. They want a government that reflects them. And with the warts and all, the Turkish system has allowed the current government to come to power uh, and be able to have a civilian control over the military and there's still things that we can talk about in terms of the trials that are ongoing, in terms of the media freedom that has just recently come out. There's a lot of issues there. But on a regional level, you know, it is all positive in some ways. You know, having just returned from Lebanon, the, the big issue is not why are the Turks here, but why aren't they here enough? We want them to come back. We want them to mediate. We don't really want the Americans to get involved with the tribunal issues. We want Turkey to get involved because they are a Muslim power that can understand the sensitivities in this part of the world. So I think on a regional level, things are looking up. Finally, let, let me say a few words on the international. Turkey is now a major international player. You know, we used to talk about them as being a rising or potential. I think they've arrived. Um, the bottom line is Turkey was a founder of the G20, which has now become the international organization that will now begin to take ownership over the international financial and economic policies in the world. It's clearly the, the, the forum of choice for, for most countries around the world. And it's really begun to show its, its diplomatic muscle by taking over things like the Organization of Islamic Conference. There's a Turkish uh, gentleman leading that who clearly was being pushed by the Turks to lead it. Uh, they are a member of the UN uh, Security Council. They're still a member of the EU. And despite all the problems that the EU-Turkish relationship have, and I would say they're in a deep freeze at the moment, uh, Turkey still has continued on that path despite all the obstacles. It would seem very easy for the Turks to throw up their hands and say, we've tried everything and you guys have kept us on the doorstep for 40 years. To heck with all of you. And yet they have not done that. And I give the, the Turkish leadership credit for that. And the bottom line is that the EU membership allows Turkey to continue to represent the model that it would not be if it didn't have that link. Um, I think the questions that are being asked in Washington sometimes are short-sighted. Why isn't Turkey doing what, they, what we want them to do? I think it, the very obvious answer from a scholar's point of view is look at their national interests. What are their national interests? As a neighbor of Iran, I can understand why uh, Turkey would have hesitations with the sanctions. I can understand why the Turks would look at sanctions as being ineffective. I think historically sanctions have never been, uh, have never really been able to do what they're intended to do. But as a symbolic value, it's important the international community is able to stand together. And right now, Turkey is standing outside of that international community. In a community that includes Russia and China, Turkey and Brazil, I think in good faith we're trying to negotiate a deal. And I think there's problems on the American side of the way we communicated this to our Turkish colleagues. I think there's problems with the way the Turks have perceived this and sometimes have been naive in allowing the Iranians to use them for a variety of things on the international area. But despite all of that, I think Turkey's rise is a good thing for America. There are going to be short-term divergences. There are going to be problems. Turkey's policies on talking to Hamas, Hezbollah, and having good relations with both Damascus and Tehran are not in the U.S. interest at a certain point in time. But it's good to at least have Turkey talking to them as opposed to other actors. If we can't talk to them, why don't we have a country like Turkey that is a strong NATO ally, that is a historic ally of ours, to be able to engage them for us? But I think that that has to go with an understanding and a grain of salt that if Turkey does not play by its own universal principles and norms and tries to couch things in... Muslim versus other terms or Sunni versus other terms, that's going to be particularly problematic on the international level. And the uniqueness of Turkey is the fact that it's able to be inclusive and it's able to look both east and west at the same time. And I think from an American perspective, as the U.S. and, and our power begins to wane, and I don't say this in a negative sense, I don't want get into discussions like we had in the 1980s about America losing its primacy and its power. I think it's a general just fact that Asia is beginning to rise economically and as that happens the U.S. is in a unique position as being both a transatlantic and a trans-Pacific player that the relative share of U.S. GDP and U.S. power will begin to go down. I don't see this as a negative thing. I think if anything it allows the U.S. to reach out to our allies and work more closely together as opposed to trying to do things on our own. And when I look at the partners around the world that share our principles 
principles and share our democratic values. I look at Turkey as being one of the most important among a handful of very important countries in there. And so I think that on the international level, there's a lot that can be said and a lot of positive things that we can talk about. So let me just stop right there since I think I put a lot out there and kind of open it to as much discussion as we can have. So thank you very yeah. much. Well, the, that, that is a lot of information <laughs> in a short time. I want to uh, dive in just a little bit into the, the new politics here in Washington. Uh, let's take, for example, the uh, flotilla incident. Uh, Turkey has demanded an apology. Davutoglu said uh, that uh, we think friends can apologize to one another. That's what he's quoted as saying. And uh, how will that by itself, in the context of U.S. politics, uh, let's say, possibly delay the appointment and the confirmation of an ambassador or yeah. other, other uh, uh, impacts? I mean, so that, that's absolutely crucial. I mean, I think, you get, I think it's very easy I think it's very easy from an outside perspective to blame everything on the so-called Jewish lobby. Um, there are a lot of friends of Israel uh, in this country, including myself, who, who believe that the state of Israel has a right to exist. But that doesn't mean that we take everything that the Israeli government does as being the best and, and as being, um, you know, it's okay to disagree on policy that Israel implements versus being anti-Semitic. And I, I'm, I'm very clear on that. And I think that the idea that the, the foreign minister was talking about makes sense. Look, if a friend does something wrong to somebody, you can apologize. What's fascinating to me, um, we, we just had uh, Tiffany Livni up at Harvard, and here is an opposition party leader that of all the different spectrum in Israel should be willing to criticize the Netanyahu government for the mismanagement of that issue. Yeah. And if you want to blame Netanyahu or you want to blame Barack, who was the defense minister who was in charge of ordering it, mm -hmm. whoever it is, somebody needs to step up and say, the loss of life is not acceptable in any way for mm -hmm. any type of democratic and nation, uh, you know, a, a nation that, ha that aspires to be an international player. And that hasn't come. And I think the reason that hasn't come is because Israel is feeling particularly vulnerable right now. The fact is, it seems that Israel has no friends in the neighborhood. And the friends that it does have like Egypt and Jordan are so weak and so delegitimized that it doesn't really do much. And it seems that America is the only friend of Israel right now. And so I think as a result of that environment, it becomes particularly politicized and, sens and sensitive. And I, the Turks have not made it easy to apologize. The Turks, I have to say this, <clears throat> have been on not only the domestic campaign trail, given that elections are coming up, it's a very popular thing to talk about. Criticizing Israel wins votes in Turkey. Mm -hmm. It also wins you friends in the rest of the Middle East because it's a zero-sum game. You're either with Israel or you're against Israel. And that was something that Turkey was uniquely suited to be able to play. Now, more or less, is taken aside. I mean, I've heard the foreign minister and the prime minister say it themselves. They won't deal with this government in Israel. Well, how big an issue will this be in the confirmation as opposed to maybe the Iran uh, nuclear Brazilian uh, Turkish uh, agreement? I mean, the confirmation hearing in, in particular, uh, you know, I just wrote an article that you referenced where I basically pointed out the fact that we, the U.S. ambassador to Turkey uh, has not even gotten a hearing date yet. We don't even know when he's going to go through a confirmation hearing. And in confirmation hearings, all these difficult issues of U.S.-Turkey will come up. Um, I don't think the Mami Marvin incident by itself will come up, but I think Turkey's general stance on Israel will be coming up. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, we heard it on the floor in, the, in Congress this summer where you had uh, people like Mike Pence and Gary Ackerman, who are both coming from a Republican and Democrat point of view, accusing Turkey of turning its back on the West. Mm -hmm. And what they use as evidence for that is the Israel policy change, which I think you can, you can justify based on policy grounds, and Iran. And Iran is the biggest one. I mean, look, sure. Sure. When, when we had the UN Security Council resolution, why the Turks needed to vote no is still unclear to me. Listen, I've talked to the foreign minister and the prime minister directly about this. They give a very good explanation. They say, they're our neighbor. If we had said yes, we would have gotten punished. But they can't explain to me the difference between an abstention vote and a no vote. Lebanon, which is a proxy for Iran through Hezbollah, voted abstention. Well, how do you explain that David Tolu says, of course we were coordinating with the Americans at every stage. Nobody from Washington can say that Turkey acted on its own. Our purpose was to ease tension and to contain the nuclear, the Iranian nuclear program. Yeah, I mean, he says this a lot. And one of the things that's fascinating is how quiet Washington is. Washington has not come out and made anything known about what happened. As best I can tell, there was miscommunication on a lot of different levels here because communicating with Washington from the foreign minister's point of view could be talking to somebody in the National Security Council, it could mean talking to somebody in the embassy, it could mean talking to somebody at the State Department, it could mean talking to somebody in our defense side of things. And whether or not that was effectively communicated to our president, and I have to say to give President Obama credit, he was the one that basically said drop it. You know, a lot, a lot of Americans were very angry about the UN Security Council vote and really thought Turkey was snubbing, snubbing us in some ways. And the president said, we're going to continue forward with U.S.-Turkish 
relations, this is not going to be uh, you know, a hindrance but for us. But the implication us. is somehow that uh, somebody in the U.S. government was okay with the Brazilian-Turkish deal on uh, uranium refinement. My, my, my personal view on this is that I think the Americans did not think the Turks could do it, and they, they gave them a letter that they had six months ago and said, if you can get this, sure, we'll discuss it. And they, you know, I, don't, I think though the Turks, and I, I would never call the foreign minister uh, to say something that's not true, but I think that there might be miscommunications at lower levels okay. where you know, he was checking in and Washington wasn't really taking it seriously until it I happened. See. And if you think about it from a Turkish point of view, let's just look at it from a domestic point of view, this is a great win for Turkey, right? It shows how important Turkey and Brazil are, and the image right. of the prime minister going to Tehran and holding his hands up with Ahmadinejad and Lula plays really well in Turkey that does not play very well here. And I think that the AKP has been very surprised at the fallout from that. I mean, even in Turkey, the CHP and other parties have been using it against them to say, what are you doing? You know, the Iranians are a hmm. fanatical, revolutionary Islamic republic, and you're trying to get close to them. You know, the thing that really is disturbing to me is, on the day after the sanctions were passed in the UN, the prime minister came out and said, we're going to triple trade with Iran. That's not what an ally should be saying. That, mm. that was not coordinated at all with the U.S., obviously. Right. And some of Turkey's behavior in the region is concerning at that level. Very good, very good. Now, maybe we can take this opportunity to um, pass the microphone around to uh, someone who might want to ask Joshua a question. Do we have any questions here? The gentleman in the back. Uh, Tom Nevers from the State Department. I'd be interested in, I'd be interested in your uh, views on how oh. Turkey views nuclear proliferation, both uh, globally and in particular case of Iran. Are they worried about it? Or yeah, yeah that, that's a really good question. And that's kind of the, that's the million dollar question because I can tell you what the official line is. And you know the official line, obviously, working the State Department. The official line is that a, you know, they want a nuclear-free Middle East. The problem, of course, with that is that they're targeting Israel by making that statement because everybody knows Israel has nuclear deterrence capabilities. Mm -hmm. Nobody talks about it because then it would you know, obligate Israel, even though they're not the signatory to the NDT. Here's my, here's my reaction to this, and here's my gut perspective on it. I think the Turks don't see Iran as a threat, and they don't see Iran as, a, as any Iranian nuclear capability as being a real threat to them. I think their own internal assessments say that even if Iran were to get a, a warhead equipped nuclear weapon, it would be not sophisticated at the level that would pose a direct threat. And it would be more dangerous to think about what would happen if there were uh, nuclear devices that were given to terrorist organizations in Turkey than actually a state actor like Iran controlling it. So the Revolutionary Guard and the Supreme Leader and the President decided to go for that. I think the calculation on the Turkish side is, look, Iran is so divided in terms of the different levels. I mean, you talk to any Turkish leader, their, their immediate comment is, how could, what is wrong with America? Why do you guys take Iran seriously? You're making them into a much bigger bugaboo than they deserve. These guys are disorganized on the domestic level, as we saw with the protest last year. They, they, there's a lot of fissures within the Iranian context. Now, where I think the Turks are being slightly naive is thinking about what this means 20 years from now and what this means in terms of if Iran were to declare a nuclear capability, I'm less concerned about the threat perception in Turkey than I am about in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, and other areas. Because it seems clear to me that the day that Iran declares that it's a nuclear power, the very next day you're going to have three or four other major states in the region that for prestige reasons and for domestic politics reasons, including Turkey, will have to declare that they're going to begin working on it. I think that's where the big issue comes in. And that's where, as you well know, the missile defense issue becomes a critical one. And I think what's fascinating about the discussions that we're having right now, at least, is that um, Turkey is not talking about whether or not they want to be a part of it. They want to know what the threat perceptions are going to be and who they're going to target. Um, and given the, the leaked documents that we saw recently, and <coughs> evidently they've changed the threat perception on Israel and Russia and Iran and Syria, these are all really important big dynamics and big changes that need to be coordinated with your allies, and particularly if you're a NATO member, uh, what that means. Because if Turkey is going to try to create some type of union in, in the Middle East that has an economic component, the, nat the next logical component is a security one. And the Turks have not had a very positive experience with that. The last security alliance they were part of in the Middle East was a Baghdad pact, which fell apart uh, as a result of regional dynamics. And so 
to answer the specific question you said, I don't think that the Turks at this point are concerned at all. But I also don't think they will be concerned until the day after. And unfortunately, the day after is too late in some ways. Um, and that I think, I think that comes in a lot of ways because they look at the discussion in Washington and basically say, look, you guys are hysterical. So as a result, we're going to react the other direction. And you guys are blowing this up into major, you know, into such big disproportionate consortium that we don't even need to have a discussion about this. And so while we talk about confrontation and we talk about how to deal and contain with Iran, Turkey has become the engaged actor. And you know, I think there's potential here for a good cop, bad cop to be played, but we're not working very closely together uh, at all levels. Um, you know, and I think that it's important that you know, the places like the State Department and the Defense Department and the security and intelligence communities work together. And as you well know, the interagency process is particularly difficult in a case like Turkey. Uh, because being able to coordinate all these things and being able to have all the different components of this relationship make it increasingly difficult and the Turks will find different ways of saying, look, that's important, we'll go down with this issue, but you need to help us on this issue. And they're just, I mean, without an ambassador there, I, I really am having a hard time understanding who's going to be able to focus all of our energy on that without having somebody who can say, look, this is a major issue, we need to go directly to the White House and figure these types of things out. Anybody else? The first um, what is, in your opinion, how, uh, to what extent the uh, accession, the possible accession of Turkey to European Union could increase the role of Turkey in the region mm -hmm. or to contain Turkey from becoming a regional player? Mm -hmm. My second question is, um, could you elaborate more on, uh, uh, on the Turkey-Russia relationship mm -hmm. in the context of uh, Nabucco and uh, versus yeah. Let me start with the last one because that's a, a, a lot, a lot easier in some ways. Um, look, my dissertation looked at the role of post-imperial successor states, former empires that, that become successor states and deal with the legacy of the past. If you were to tell me 10, 20 years ago that Russia and Turkey would be major trading partners, would be major allies on the global scale together, I probably would have laughed at you. But that's exactly what we're looking at today. When you look at Russia, it's had the highest growth rate of trade between the two. And mostly it's being done because of construction companies from Turkey into Russia and because of the energy that, that Turkey is buying. And so the, the real issue that we're talking about is not just the rapprochement between Turkey and Russia in a post-Cold War environment, but also two major regional powers that realize that there are a lot of things that could ruin their relations domestically, whether it's the Muslim extremism in uh, Russia or the diaspora communities within Turkey, and also the Caucasus being a major issue for the two countries. Um, and basically two very strong states, very strong leaders looking at each other and finding a way to kind of work together on this. Um, and the real major issue is the energy one that you talked about. You know, a lot of the discussion about energy, uh, about Turkey as an energy hub is so fascinating. Turkey has no energy resources at all. What it has is a geographic location that makes it kind of the crossroads for all the energy pipelines. Right. And the real discussion is the two major players here are basically the EU and Russia. Because EU is the major market, Russia is the supplier. And the energy pipelines that currently are being discussed all go through Turkey at some point in time. The question is, which one do they want to buy? Um, this last year, I spent at the Transatlantic Academy, and we had a fellow who was focusing specifically on the energy issue. And you know, his analysis tended to show that it's really interesting the way the Russians react. They're reactive to things, meaning the EU announces that they're going to create the Nabucco pipeline, and that they're going to be able to bring all this energy from the Central Asian republics to the EU market to have less dependency on Russia. What does Russia do? It announces that it's going to try to create something with it. Now, it's not financially viable. Uh, viable. It doesn't make any financial sense, the Russian projects that are out there. But that's not something that really constrains the Russian state. Because of the price of energy, because of the way Gazprom is structured, they can do this just to try to um, discourage the, the Western market. Because the Western markets are based on uh, market principles. And so if you were to have, I mean, Nabucco by itself is already a pretty shady uh, investment to begin with, meaning that there may not be profit margins in, in the nation states of Europe and the European Union with a foreign policy, common foreign policy, would have to invest something to make it financially viable. And the Russians basically, even by talking about these other options, are making it such that it's financially uh, unstable for the, for the, for the uh, European Union to think about it. And so a lot of European colleagues um, will say, look, let's see if Russia puts its money where, th where its mouth is. Um, 
That's a question. That's an open question. If you ask my own personal view on it, I think that if push came to shove and the West and, and Nabucco was able to become a reality, that I don't think the Russians would continue with their project. I think they would have small projects, some of the some of the smaller South Stream, because there's lots of different varieties of what the South Stream would look like. Um, and I think that in terms of financially viable, Russia selling natural gas to Turkey makes the most sense. So Turkey being the hub and Turkey being the final destination for that. Um, I think that makes it a lot more financially viable because of the fact that Nabucco doesn't just have one source of energy. It comes from Iraq, it comes from Azerbaijan, it comes from Turkmenistan, it comes from all the different republics as opposed to being just Russia. And I think that Russia uh, is in a really interesting spot right now given that more or less the economy is, is hostage to energy prices. Uh, and I think that if things change and, and you know climate change and all these energy resources that shifting that we're having uh, both in the US and China and the developing world that would change the calculation. So I, I do think that Turkish-Russian relations are going through an abnormally warm period right now. I, th I do expect in say 10 years, if the Nabucco pipeline were to be realized, that that would be something that would cause tensions in Turkish-Russian relations and would not be the source of positive developments. Um, that feeds directly into the EU question. Um, you know, if you look at it from the Arab world, the discussion I always have with my Arab colleagues is, well, we're, we're, we're plan B. The only reason the Turks are looking to the Middle East is because they got rejected by Europe. Now, clearly from a Turkish point of view, that would not be the case because you couldn't explain why Turkey has been on the path towards Europe since 1963 and the Ankara Protocols. But I do think there is some logic here. The AKP in particular has been very strategic in its, in its cooperation with the EU. They did more than any other party in 2004 to get the accession date. Uh, and to become a full-fledged accession member. But since that point in time, they haven't done very much at all. And if you look at the polling right now, what used to be a no-brainer in terms of 70% for the EU has flipped on its head. Most people in Turkey want to be members, but they don't actually believe they ever will become members. And so as a result, there's a real pessimism there. And also, given what happened with Greece and the financial crisis of this summer, many Turks kind of say, wow, thank goodness we weren't part of the EU because we'd be bailing out the Greeks and made these silly decisions. Now, you know, Turkish banks are buying up Greek banks. There are cartoons in Turkey all the time about, you know, putting a Turkish flag on Acropolis and Pantheon, etc. Um, it's just kind of a, a fun historical note on these things. Um, and Turkey's really been able to uh, show its own economic clout as a result of that. And the question is, what does Turkey in the EU look like? Because to me, you know, Turkey will be, you know, one among equals. I don't see it being the most powerful country, right? It will be the same as Germany. Germany can do a lot with the EU and we, we all follow German foreign policy when Merkel speaks we all listen but it doesn't mean that what Merkel says becomes EU foreign policy. She still has to negotiate uh, with Britain and with France. And I think Turkey would have the same issue and I think Turkey is prepared for that. The one area that I don't think that we're there yet and the bottom line is I, I'm probably more pro-EU than anybody out there. I mean, I tend to be accused of being both a Turkish nationalist and also being an internationalist. It's a fun dichotomy to be stuck between. Um, but Turkey as an EU member also has to figure out the character of its state and has to figure out the role that the military will play in that state. I understand that Turkey has a dangerous neighborhood. I understand that Turkey has security threats that are more than your average Belgium or Luxembourg. But at the end of the day, for me, what the EU represents is an idea. It's not a Christian club. It's not a cultural values club. It's about democratic, transparent, and open human rights regime. And if Turkey wants to be a part of that club, it has to implement all and not just some of the aki. And as a result, we're still 10 to 15 years away. What I get upset about is because of the way that the political playing field has been set for Turkey, it seems that every step it takes forward, it takes two steps back with the Europeans. Every time it makes an advance, you have European nationalist leaders who use Turkey as a domestic issue, like Sarkozy has, like Merkel has, like the Austrians have, like the Cypriots have, to, re to really rally against them. And the entire discussion that's going on globally about the role of Islam and democracy and the compatibility of these two has, has found Turkey right in the crosshairs. And as a result, it's very easy to kind of um, accuse, um, accuse Turkey of not being genuine in its process. And I think that that's a little bit unfair on our European colleagues. And I think here, this has been something that America's always been able to do. We've always been able to kind of be a referee in this game. And we've always been fully supportive of, of Turkish membership in the EU, not because we think it's good just for the EU or just for Turkey, but because it's a win-win. You know, the more transparent, the more open Turkey becomes through the EU process, and as an EU member, inshallah, one day, it will become a more active member and a, and a more positive model 
for the rest of the region. And I think that you talk to anybody in the region, they all look at Turkey, and one of the attractive features of Turkey is its EU connection. It has a privileged partnership now. One day it might be a member, and it has a unique ability to bridge these worlds that none of the other EU member states would have. And so I think it's a win-win in all these different categories. But why do you think the U.S. hasn't made uh, Turkish entrance into the EU a higher priority for our foreign policy? You know, I think that actually we did under the Bush administration, and we got hit pretty hard by the French in particular. I mean, Chirac's comment to Bush when he made positive statements about this was, but out of it, it's none of your own business. And I think mm -hmm. part of the issue is we've had our own rift within the transatlantic community between America and Europe. And that's something that Obama has been working to kind of bring back together. But there still is a sense of, you, but this is a domestic issue for us, you know. Right. Turkey is a foreign policy issue for us, but if you know if, if Mexico was looking to become the 51st state of America, would we take kindly to the French doing this? In fact, if anything, as we saw in the last last presidential election, you know, the Kerry one, anything the French say positive about a Democratic candidate does not play well in <laughs> real America. And so, I think it's a domestic politics issue here, and I think that the U.S. has been doing things. Um, <clears throat> I would hope that we could be more innovative and energetic in what we're doing because, you know, coming out with statements in support of Turkey's membership in the EU is fine, but what's actually being done? Are, are there ways in which we can engage our Turkish colleagues? I mean, the Turks are, are frenetic right now with energy. I mean, they've opened 13 to 15 embassies in Africa alone. Every other country seems to be going through a problem of trying to cut down their budget. Turkey's expanding. Turkish Airlines is flying everywhere in the region. Turkey's on a real high, and, it, you know, if we can find a way to harness that, for our own interests, meaning saying, look, we want you to be the representative of the transatlantic community, given that the rest of Europe seems to be in a deep funk as a result of the economic crisis, we would love for Turkey to be our representative. But instead, the Turks continue to hear over and over again, you're not really European. You're not really one of us. And as a result, whenever they go, they're doing things on their own or they're doing things for their other region. Mm -hmm. In other words, people have no problem the Turks representing Muslims or representing Middle Easterners, but they do have a problem with Turkey representing Europe. Mm -hmm. And that's a real problem. And that's something that Americans don't have. We don't have to hang up on this. Mm -hmm. We never had the Ottomans at our gates. Right. And as a result, I think that's something that Americans can really help our European colleagues with and without being accused of simply doing things for strategic interest. There's a larger principle here that needs to be fought for that you don't see very often in the discourse. Very good. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am, in the back. Christina Olney with Yusuf. I'd just like to clarify that your major concern with Turkey's behavior is not so much that we're losing Turkey and that's, you know, turning from west to east, but rather that it's being short-sighted, particularly uh, with regards to Iran and, or a potential nuclear Iran. Mm -hmm. So could you, could you yeah, just clarify that for me? <clears throat> You're absolutely right. I mean, <laughs> I spent all of last year in D.C. trying to get rid of the who lost Turkey debate. I failed miserably, as you can see, uh, in the headlines of every newspaper in the last couple months. I don't think the who lost Turkey debate is a useful one. Turkey is there. It's always been there. And <clears throat> it's more about our perceptions of what Turkey is and what it represents than their own thing. It, it's an American schizophrenic behavior. And it's not just American. It's West as well. What I mean by what concerns me about Turkey, and you, you, you were right to clarify this, um, is not necessarily behavior. I mean, I, I don't see any behavior that deeply concerns me, right? The Turkish ambassador being recalled from Tel Aviv to sit in Ankara until they get a formal apology is one thing. And to cut off military exercises and to stop intelligence sharing with Israel is one thing. But it seems to me that that would be the natural response when you have something like the Mavi Marmar incident happened. They have not cut off diplomatic relations. There are still discussions being had on the economic and on the diplomatic level, and there's still a lot of uh, military cooperation between the two. What I'm concerned about is what the rhetoric that the current Turkish leaders are using will lead to in the future. And what I mean by that is I tend to look at the Iranians as seeing the Turks as being able to play them. Uh, and Turkey being so over-eager to put itself and position itself between the West and Iran that Turkey gets crushed in the process, right? Iran does not have any love loss for Turkey. I don't think Turkey has any love loss for Iran. You know, most people that I talk to, Turkish businessmen, say, look, Iran is not a very good economic winner here. Like, there's just not much complement, there's just no complementarity here. And when the Turkish businesses have tried to go into Iran because of the bureaucracy, because of the problems there, they can't really work in the way they do in Syria and the Arab world. And so the, when you hear the Prime Minister making statements about increasing trade three times, and my brother and great friend Ahmadinejad, and really 
you know, lathering it on, which may make sense in a context in Iran and may make sense in the context of Turkey, the perception from outside is particularly disturbing. And given the fact that we've already got a problem with Turkey and Israel on a bilateral level, and people who are already sensitive to Israel's security in the region see Turkey as becoming an adversary, this is just one more irritant we don't need. And I don't think that there's a fundamental difference here in terms of long-term uh, what we should do about Iran. The long-term approach I think that any sane person sees is bringing Iran into the global community. The question is how do we do that without the revolutionary elements in Iran getting a nuclear weapon and then using it in some way that might be detrimental, uh, whether it's at you know threatening Israel with its rhetoric or whether it's um, finding proxies like Hezbollah or Hamas to be able to you know, support them in that way. Because that's not the way that a responsible state should act. And I think that while Turks in their official capacities always tell you that that's what they're doing, sometimes I see that their enthusiasm for the engaging side of things and the mediating side of things is lost on the other side. And I see the same thing when it comes to Azerbaijan and Armenia as well, right? The Turks have been so eager to get out in front and to find a solution that's a quick fix in some ways to re be able to fix their own domestic problems here, meaning the Armenian Genocide Resolution, that they're not seeing the broader regional dynamics of what this means. Because you can't simply force parties to solve these things. It has to come from within. And I think that that's something that Turkey has always been good at doing in terms of working with all actors. But I just think that sometimes, at least in the current environment, given the elections are coming up, they're using these international issues for a domestic side that then has a re repercussion on the international level. So does that, I mean, it's a convoluted ex Yeah, and are you suggesting then that the agreement with Iran and Brazil was a, was a bad idea then on Turkey's behalf? I mean, I think history will tell on this. I, my personal view is that it was an opportunity lost. Um, and I think it was more an opportunity lost not because it was a bad deal, but because of the U.S. response to it. Um, and what I'm saying about the Iran deal is it, the Iran deal is separate from the, the sanctions vote, right? The Iran deal happened, then the sanctions happened, right? And to me, the no vote was particularly detrimental because I don't see the value of a no vote versus an abstention. An abstention would have had all the same benefits. It would have signaled to Iran that, yes, we're still going to work with you. We don't, we, you know, we're not voting for the sanctions, but we're not voting against it either. And so to me, the no vote was an unnecessarily provocative action of basically Turkey being upset that the US and the Western community didn't see their point of view on this one. And I think the Turks knew very well before they made that vote. In fact, up until a few days before that vote, the sources that I was talking to were all pretty confident that they were going to abstain. And when they did the no vote, which I think, my own private view, is that it was a personal decision made at the top level that they were going to stick it to show the entire world how powerful Turkey was, that's problematic. That behavior is problematic. And what I would say, anybody who knows Turks and has been to the region, it's, a, it's not a Turkish phenomenon, it's a Mediterranean phenomenon. You're either completely depressed about life and the entire world's about to fall apart, or you're feeling so great that you're now the biggest power in the world. And as a result, there, there's, dare, dare I say it, a bit, a bit of arrogance and self-confidence that goes beyond it. Because Turkey has every right to be self-confident. Turkey has every right to be able to make the deal that it did, but then to behave in the way it did is not becoming of a major power. That's becoming of a child that didn't, that didn't get its way, and that's a problem. So I can, I can blame my government and my, my, you know, my country for our behavior around the world, but that's what I'm talking about with the Turkish context. So in terms of the actual deal itself, I think it was, a, it was a moment, it was an opportunity lost, but that's because the Turks, I don't personally think they were doing a very good job of coordinating with us, meaning the Americans. They were going to try to get this deal for their own domestic side and for their own international prestige, and then they were going to come to Americans and present it and say, look, we got it. You told us what to do and we got it. And the Americans said, look, that was six months ago. That ship has sailed. We're now going to go for sanctions. And the Turks felt upset because they were not consulted. If I may just lastly ask one more question. Um, if you could just enlighten me on why you think that Turkey wouldn't want sanctions on Iran? Oh, I mean, the reason Turkey doesn't want sanctions on Iran is history. The sanctions on Iraq hurt Turkey more than anybody else. And the number, they, I mean, I think they lost an ungodly amount of money. And one of, the, one of the stipulations that Turkey had for supporting the sanctions against Iraq the first time was because they thought the Americans and the Westerners would pay them back for any revenue lost. Now they're under no illusions that any <laughs> sanctions would basically directly hurt Turkish businesses. Because even though there's not much Turkish businesses intrinsically in Iran, there's a lot of cross-border trade, both on the black market side and also there's over a million Iranians coming in. Turkey's one of the few places Iranians can actually travel with no visa. And so if there were to be sanctions, what that means is that Iranians can't open banks, bank accounts in, in Turkey. 
It also means that Turkish businesses can't directly sell to the Iranian market. They have to go through a third party. And who's that third party going to be? Probably China, probably Russia. And so the Turks are kind of saying, why are we losing out on this? Why are we being punished? We are the only neighbor. We are the only UN Security Council member that's a, that's a neighbor to Iran. And clearly, because of those relations, and I mean, and the, the bottom line is, I don't think the Turks think that sanctions will work. And so as a result, they, they just don't, they, they, number one, are not in favor of them uh, for that very kind of basic pragmatic reason. Okay. We have a question here on the front row. Hey, I'm Diane Perlman. I'm at the Institute for Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason. Uh, another good Virginian here. <laughs> well, I, anyway, yes. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Um, anyway, thank you for this. Um, I was at the UN during the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty when this all happened, mm -hmm. and um, it was pretty uh, disheartening. The US rejected it and slapped on the sanctions. So um, my question is around the issue of, of conflict analysis and conflict transformation. That, um, And also, that, well, I, I agree with you that I think, well, what I heard was that the US never expected that the deal, that they would succeed in this. And also, I think we kind of like to be in control and we don't like other parties being so helpful. Hmm. Um, and, you know, and the way that we're, I'm interested in like how you frame the problem and we're framing it as, you know, Iran is the enemy, they must not get nuclear weapons and we have to use punitive, coercive, mm -hmm. um, fighting, uh, painful punishments yep. to make them do what we want. And you know, from what many people, Think. I mean, some people think they're working, but a lot of people think that they won't work or they're allergic to that and it makes them more defiance and increases the popularity of hard liners. Um, and I've heard other, you know, um, Kinzer has this book on reset mm -hmm. and there's some, and I've heard people over the years talk about that Israel and Iran do have mm -hmm. common interests, but we're kind of so gripped by um, the image of the enemy mm -hmm. and uh, a concrete thinking rather than understanding dynamics. Um, so I'm just, w and I, was you know I went to another conference on Turkey a few months ago and about how they're emerging as helping with conflict. Um, so anyway, I think we need a paradigm mm -hmm. sh that the paradigm we're in is impossible and yeah. can't possibly work. Turkey seems to have a role, but it seems like there's so many forces yeah. working against that. And positive inducements, tension mm -hmm. reduction, conflict transformation. I guess I'll comment briefly on what you said. I mean, I, I agree with you that there needs to be a paradigm shift. I, I'm not an Iran expert, so I can put that out there up front. But as far as I can understand it, one of the biggest problems is what would it look like to have an Iran that doesn't have America as the bad guy anymore? So, you know, without that, the regime would have a very difficult time because, you know, it was fascinating to be in Lebanon. I was there when Ahmadinejad came. And literally everywhere in Lebanon, he had his pictures everywhere, and he gave $900 million to the southern part of Lebanon. He can't even provide electricity for his own people in Tehran and Iran. He's giving it to Lebanon. You can imagine that would not go over so well in Iran if there was not this bugaboo of the United States as the evil Satan and the evil empire. And so I think that there are, there are domestic incentives for that regime to continue to see America from an adversarial point of view. I give President Obama a lot of credit. The first year, he did almost everything he could to try to reach out. You know, the Nehru's video that he gave in terms of the, the, the attempts. It seemed to me he was coming with open hands with a genuinely, a genuinely new approach that we had not seen in American politics before. And he not only was not reciprocated, but more or less the Iranians basically kind of flipped it at them and basically used it against us in some ways. And the Iranians of anybody, if I look at the regional dynamics that I was talking about, are, are in the ascendancy right now. It seems that with the new government in Iraq and the new way things are going, with Lebanon, with Gaza, with the whole region, Iran is the one that everybody's scared about. They're in the position. Now, I don't think that that, that is sustainable moving forward. And unless there's a paradigm shift, then we may not see what that looks like. But that paradigm shift, the, the, the question I have from our end is, yes, America needs to have a new, we need to have a new perspective too. You know, the idea of containing Iran has clearly failed. It's been 31 years. We've not been able to induce them to change their regime. I don't think that any time you try to change another regime, Regime, I don't think regime change is a very good phrase in Washington these days. It's not something that America is very good at. Nation building is also not something we're very good at. And we have plenty of problems at home that nobody really wants to concentrate on Iran next. We've already seen what it was like in Iraq. Afghanistan's hard enough as it is. You know, I don't, unless there's a paradigm shift, you're right. The, the, the logical conclusion to the way that we're currently marching is basically a war with Iran. 
Um, and I don't know if that means war with Iran or if America striking first, or if that means Israel striking and America getting involved. And to me, that's a truly terrifying point of view because that there's there's nobody who wins in that scenario. Everybody loses. Uh, and to me, that's why I'm so hopeful about Turkey and Turkey being able to really give economic incentives for all the players to be regionally integrated. The problem is in this country, the paradigm shift that needs to happen is engagement is not the same as being beholden, and it doesn't mean that you're shifting axes. And the idea of our narrative of Turkey all always being a good member of the West and now suddenly shifting needs to be changed. What do you say about 1974 in Cyprus when Turkey went against U.S. interests and decided to intervene in Cyprus? I mean, there have been many cases in, in the Cold War period that we think about as being the honeymoon period uh, that Turkey has not gone with U.S. policy and had its own national interest. And given Turkey's rising dynamic, given that it's a much bigger player, there are going to be more times that this is going to happen. But you have to look at the longer term to see what that means you know, moving forward. So if Kinzer's right and there needs to be a reset and Turkey and Iran and the U.S. can be the best players in the Middle East, more power to them. The problem is that type of innovative thinking and creative side of things gets, gets, gets lost in this town in particular when the sausage machine of policy making gets, gets done with a simplistic parsimony arguments that we hear. Very good. I guess we need to wrap up soon, but maybe I should give you this opportunity to tell you, tell us about uh, what your new book is going to be and, and, uh, and where we can buy it uh, <laughs> when, uh, when it comes out. A shameless plug, I appreciate yeah. it. Um, so my book is basically looking at Turkey and Japan. Uh, it looks at the role of former empires and when they collapse, how do they re-engage with their neighborhood? Uh, and you know, most people look at Turkey and Japan and they look at that and say, how could you possibly do a book on that? There's not much to compare. But if you take it back maybe 100 years, it was a lot to think about. Think about the Ottoman Empire, the Japanese Empire, both of these kind of non-Western states and empires that were part of the West. They were part of the Great Empire Club uh, and they challenged in some ways, even though they borrowed modernization and other ideas from the West. And having been defeated in World War I and World War II, how does that process, how does that memory of the past, so how have the Ottomans come back? Anybody who goes to Istanbul today, you can buy t-shirts that say the empire is back with the Ottoman script. There's a script right back there that has a sultan uh, signature on it. It's become one of the biggest fashionable things. Uh, and in Japan, you're seeing similar things. Does that affect, I mean, my, my, my argument is, I think that that affects how their foreign policy behavior uh, has. And so the idea of the kind of the strictly secular Western Turkey that sees the West and the EU as the only point at the end is changing so that they say, wait, wait a minute, why do we have to be Western or Eastern? Our forefathers of the Ottomans were both in the Balkans and most of the Sultans actually were not of ethnic Turkish stock. They had blue eyes, green eyes. Ataturk himself had different characteristics and you would think of somebody being from the Middle East. Why do we have to be one or the other? And I think that that kind of confidence that comes from identity is, 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 is had when you're able to shed the identity that was created by these republics at, at the founding moment and were kind of solidified during the Cold War. So as these countries are rediscovering their roots and their past, that allows us to think about them in a different way. So that's kind of what I'm, I'm hoping. Uh, and I'll be looking for a publisher Very in good. the spring, and I will uh, hopefully come back and I can present that as well. Well, on behalf of the Remy Forum, thank you for coming again, and I'm sure you'll be back soon. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much.